is going on, everybody? It's G from the F Word, and I am by myself. This week's a bit of an interesting week. Um, oh, hello, hello, Greco Canuck. Uh, it's going to be an interesting week because um, we couldn't get together our usual Thursday or Friday. We have this big event going on that we're all involved in and everything like that. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I haven't done one of these in a while, and for good reason. Um, I'm really much better off when I work with other people. Um, and for those of you who are live, thank you for joining me live. Again, I'm going solo, so it's a little bit different, but as you're waving, I'll try to wave. Thanks. I'll try to. I'll try to. Kathy underscore MCDG, do your job. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do a solo episode. Uh, bear with me. I tend to ramble. I tend to go all over the place. So if that's not your bag, I apologize. Trust me, this isn't going to be a thing that happens all the time. But I did want to talk about something, and it was something that's kind of been uh, on my mind for a little bit, and I did come prepared, if you can hear it, with a sheet. And it's not a very long sheet, but it's a sheet nonetheless. Uh, And if anyone's out there in the live chat, uh, if you want to let me know uh, what your favorite TV shows are, your favorite finales, and your least favorite finales, because that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about television, and I'm talking about television in the context of specifically Bad finales and how they could ruin a great show. So that's that's the premise. I've got a list of some shows that I have seen myself. I haven't seen a lot of stuff. I didn't watch a lot of TV earlier on. I mean, I watched a lot of cartoons when I was younger and stuff, but there was a lull there where I just watched a lot of movies, and I'm sure a lot of people did. And then what ended up happening is TV just got better and better and better. And specifically at least for me, it was when Lost showed up. When Lost showed up, it was, uh, oh, MASH, fave finale from MASH. I've heard that. That's been on a lot of lists. Uh, When Lost showed up, it kind of changed the game for myself, my friends, and just a lot of people, I believe, in general. It was one of the first shows that I was introduced to that, um, that essentially brought a conversation out of it. And, and it became a water cooler show, as some people like to put it. Uh, so it's one of those shows that when it popped out, it was it just hit, and it hit hard. It had a, a great intro, a great first episode, pilot episode, and it just kept going and going and going. And with that move, or with that show, sorry, it brought upon the idea of this this world being unraveled slowly as our characters are in, being introduced to the world, we're also being introduced to the world. And with that comes theories and speculations and, uh, you know, in some cases, who's going to live, who's going to die, uh, who's going to betray who, all sorts of stuff like that. So for me, that was kind of the first uh, first shows that really, that really did that for me. Uh, and again, a lot of my friends. Uh, yes, it is super up close and personal, Anthony. Uh, so far I've got a couple people in the chat, no questions yet, but, uh, okay. So Lost came about and changed the game, at least in my generation that I was consciously aware of. I'm sure the game was changed before, um, but it evolved from there. And, you know, we have the TV shows that we have now. And then the reason this also came about was because of Game of Thrones, it was the biggest thing people have been talking about. I believe 2011 is when it first came about, and it is a massive, massive show. It impacted the culture. It was part of every single conversation that you can get your hands on, and as more people were discovering it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Blake, what's going on? And since its finale, obviously, a lot of people have been upset. And just like Lost, a lot of people were a little bit upset with the way that that ended. Uh, and there's a myriad of shows, beloved shows that ended up doing that. Per, I, I just finished watching Mad Men. It's been around for a long time, but I just finished watching it uh, with Sophia. And we the finale ended and we're just like, oh, like, that's it. And I don't want to spoil what happened, even though Mad Men's been out for a while, but you can catch it on Netflix. But it ends in a very uh, interesting way that... I get what they were doing and I get what it ultimately led to. But at the same time, it didn't really do much for what the show was able to establish. Uh, so it's kind of shows like that that are are culturally important, 
are that that get steeped in their own lore and what they present to us and then aren't able to to really deliver a satisfying finale. So what is a satisfying finale? The the weird thing is is that it's very different for a lot of people. So for instance, Game of Thrones. There are people that I know that were satisfied with that finale from pundits online to just general fans that I know that are, you know, outside of this YouTube podcast world and everything like that. And they just liked it. And you can't blame anybody for liking something just because, you know, the majority doesn't like it. And in fact, it went as far as to get a petition of about a million people, which I get. I don't get the petition thing like, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I understand where the fan base wants to uh, band together and make something happen. But it, I don't know, it's, it seems like something really weird. And in the case of Game of Thrones, when you're talking about a petition to redo an entire final season, um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, you're never going to get it. It's never going to happen. That's what I want to say. It's never going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is that they're not going to spend millions and millions of dollars to bring in all the actors, all the extras, all the makeup, the effects, and all that, just so you can have a satisfying conclusion to the story that you believe you were experiencing, which is a different story than what other people were experiencing. Uh, Greco Canuck says, was Don Draper sent to the ad agency north of the wall? Honestly, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> I have no idea. It almost makes you know sense in that, in that context right there. Um, so, with the way that it's been going on with uh, with the way that shows have kind of not been able to deliver or they've been fizzling out, it's a really interesting conversation because, again, it comes back to does it ruin the experience you had with the show? And I've got a couple thoughts about that um, because in most cases, no. Um, in most cases, it doesn't or I I don't believe it does ruin it, but there are exceptions. Now, Game of Thrones is one of those exceptions, in my opinion, okay, you could take that any way you want, uh, where I feel like the finale or the way that season eight unfolded ruins a lot of the show. Because when you go back and rewatch a show, for instance, like a Breaking Bad, when I watch Breaking Bad, I watch it because you get to see, or I get to see, Walter White's evolution from being a good guy to an evil person. And... Jesse's evolution from being a bit of a dirtbag and then becoming a good man at the end of it. And he then gets manipulated by Walt. And if you haven't seen Breaking Bad by now, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to spoil that one the most uh, because I adore, adore, adore that show. So that finale is was great. I love the finale. It added on to the show. And when I keep going back and rewatching it, I've seen it four times now. I pick up something that adds to the finale. Every little bit from the first episode to the very last just adds to it, or the second last, sorry, which was, I believe, Ozymandias. Uh, it adds to that finale, and it elevates the finale. Um, it was the same kind of thing where we talked about Avengers Endgame, too, uh, where Avengers Endgame was such a great movie for the fact that it elevated the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's that's how it was in my eyes. People compare it to Infinity War, rightfully so. They were shot at the same time. It was a Lord of the Rings style shooting back to back. But the difference for me between the two is that Infinity War on its own is a really great movie. But Endgame is much bigger and it caps off the entire MCU. It's bigger than Infinity War, I'll put it that way, for what it does. So then when I'm looking at some of these shows and the list I have right now, specifically of some major ones that I have watched. Uh, oh, another show I never mentioned is uh, The Wire. I mentioned on the show before, I really like The Wire. Um, the character that plays Littlefinger in Game of Thrones uh, has an incredibly interesting story arc in The Wire. Uh, a very becoming the very thing that you are trying to stop type of ending. And at least for his character. And it, it was an exceptional show. 
Uh, okay, Greco Canuck. Sopranos finale was just okay. Your thoughts? I felt kind of the same, especially when you consider the fact that it was foreshadowed earlier that one of the characters that, uh, again, it's been years and years since I've seen The Sopranos, so bear with me, uh, where he was talking about how there's nothing, it's just darkness. So we're led to believe that Tony Soprano and his family just got shot, or just he got shot in that little diner, because it was a very ominous and very mysterious and very, uh, on the one hand, unfulfilling, because you didn't really get, hey, so sorry for cutting, sorry my wife just dropped in the live show. Uh, it, it wasn't totally fulfilling because it didn't give us all the closure that we were wanting in a character like Tony Soprano. Um, and it just left it at just a blackout. And that's it. And it's kind of like, what the hell? And I get when people are saying, what the hell? And just like Greco Canuck has mentioned, like I thought it was just okay, maybe for that little bit of foreshadowing. But I've also mentioned that foreshadowing doesn't equal character development, and I'm sure you've heard that from a lot of other people. So it's really interesting how people interpret the shows that they're watching and what they feel they're going to get out of it. I'm going to take a sip of water. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, other shows I have on here, Roseanne, uh, not the new one, obviously. I'm talking about when it was first out, when it first came out back in the day. How I Met Your Mother is another one. House. Seinfeld, House of Cards, Dexter, The Office, and as we just mentioned, The Sopranos, and of course, Lost. And I've got one of the one of the notes I said is who do you blame or who do we blame, right? And it's really easy to blame the showrunners, and a lot of times you do. You, they're the ones that are making the decisions. The writers are the ones writing the scripts, anyways, and giving it to the characters and steering the characters in one way or another. Um, on our last episode, um, if you want to go back, it's called a stark contrast it was me trying to be clever you know with the starks um there was something going on there where uh oh hold on sorry i think i'm having issues with my uh recording device and it's wanting to skip some stuff sorry uh, we'll see how this goes. If it sounds like it's skipping, then I apologize because my, uh, my laptop's been doing that lately. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah. When we're talking about, um, Game of Thrones, for instance, and, and who do we blame in that case, you blame the people that are obviously making the decisions against the, the showrunners who decided to go against type or subvert expectations and give something else. You also have George R. R. Martin to blame for that because he didn't finish the books and he gave him footnotes on what's going to happen. So there's a couple ways that you can look at it. You can blame uh, Benioff and Weiss because, and this is where I stand, because they're the ones that have adapted the books and they created the show that they wanted to create. They gave importance to some things and they took away importance from other things that I'm not a book reader, but other book readers have said, this is more important than that is. And those decisions are ones they personally made with the characters that are in the show. And so because of those positions that they are, those decisions that they made, they ultimately construct the finale. Um, and again, I mentioned last episode that uh, a really intelligent pundit that I like to follow, the guy's name is Dan Merle. He's from uh, Screen Junkies and on Phantom Entertainment. He said, were these guys prepared to do the finale to a Game of Thrones? And that is a very good point. And, but this goes back to my point where, they still adapted it and they still made it their own. So then you would just assume that that is the decisions that they're going to make are the decisions that they've been making since day one. And to abandon character development like a Jamie Lannister who pretty much goes back to the way that he was or you rush the Daenerys turning into the Mad Queen storyline or you pretty much sideline Jon the whole way. Those are decisions that the creators, the writers made. Everybody had, had made that this is what they're going to do. And last line of defense is Weiss and Benioff. Those are the last lines of defense in those decisions. So it is them to blame and it is their decisions because, again, they made the choices that they made. From what I understand, Sansa Stark never got raped in the book. And that was a real real hard choice that they did. And it was a very intense choice. I remember watching it, and I know I mentioned when we were talking about Arya 
having that scene with Gendry that like we've gone through all these things and why does the Arya thing make us the most uncomfortable? Like to clear the record that what happened to Sansa was super uncomfortable. I don't actually remember watching it because it was one of those things that's just like, damn, you you really went for it. And for better or for worse, I guess, I, I don't know. It's up to you to decide. Um, I mean, I ha- still haven't decided. I think they could have they could have gone away with other types of abuse and still made Sansa Stark a very strong character and, and one of the strongest characters in the show, which they ultimately did, which is why she's one of my personal favorites. I didn't need that. Uh, but I know that they doubled down on that to add to her shitty experience or what she was going through. So, I mean, take it as it is. Um, another note I meant, or I put here, um, let's see, let's see, let's see. At which point does a show lose steam only to gradually decline like a slow-moving car crash? So, I don't know, this doesn't really go into the blame game thing. Um, again, I apologize for my delivery on this episode. I don't really do stuff by myself. And uh, I command my mind just wanders everywhere. So uh, bear with me. And if you are bearing with me up until now, thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, when a TV show loses steam, you can you don't really notice it at first. You kind of notice it a couple episodes or even a full season after. Going back to Game of Thrones, for me, Game of Thrones lost steam after season like into season seven the show had changed there were there were there were things that they were doing which to me what i was getting out of game of thrones was fundamental to the show and they changed that and in them changing that it ended up just bringing the show to that slow car crash up until the finale where every single episode after was just getting a little bit worse and a little bit worse, and a little bit worse, with some holy shit moments, but holy shit moments with no substance just feel empty. And so up from season seven for me is when it felt like it was getting empty. Season five for a lot of people wasn't great, um, and I can understand why, uh, but for me, I like season five, I like season six, and but I can just see them changing a lot of things. Um, everyone's joking about the fast travel. Everyone's joking about, <coughs> sorry, everyone's talking about how there's not that Game of Thrones esque dialogue, like that really, really meaty dialogue between characters that we got very, uh, very sparingly in those last couple of seasons, which kind of sucks because that was my favorite. It sucks for me because was, those were some of my favorite moments. The Varys and Tyrion moment in, I think, the third last episode or so in season eight was a great episode that harkens back to the days of old of Game of Thrones. And you can take that as you like. Um, so other shows in my list that I've got here where they seem to lose steam, uh, The Office is a prime example. Uh, one A top-tier show, a show that a lot of people like. And once Michael Scott left, it was losing steam. But it was even losing steam before that when they switched over to Saber. I know the Saber episode, there was one. Oh, Arturo. Hey, man. Sorry. Uh, when when the office, uh, when Dunder Mifflin switched over to Saber, that was a bit of a drop off for the show. They ended up having the one episode where um, I believe the person was doing a, um, an audit of the office itself. And he was talking to Toby about certain things and they were doing flashbacks to other episodes. And whenever I see a flashback for the most part, it pretty much means that uh, they don't have any ideas for that specific spot. They're, they're taking a little bit of a breather, but it ends up becoming a little bit lazy and fizzling out. Uh, Arturo, I'm good, man. How are you? Let me know uh, if you've got a, TV show finale that you liked or disliked, or both, whichever one. That's kind of what I'm rambling on about right now. How I Met Your Mother is another one. Uh, How I Met Your Mother was a show that I really liked at first, but they seem to forget their own history and their own continuity. Um, I know that, uh, for instance, early on in, I think, season one or two, Barney was talking about someone named Karma and that they're good, but Karma ended up being Quinn, 
later on in season seven or eight or something. And so they brought it up at that time, which made for, you know, a, a an in, like an, a typical stripper name, let's say. And yet they brought it back for Quinn to have that name. It's like they forgot about that. Barney also mentioned a sister early on, but he didn't know he had a sister until he met his dad. And then he learned he had a half sister in college or something like that, that Ted ended up, you know, getting together with, which was also weird. Um, there was a point in about season four or five, actually, sorry, it was season five. First episode of season five when Barney and Robin got together. That is when the show started just going downhill, down, down all the way. And aside from a few bright spots here and there, the show ended up changing. And when a show starts changing from what's its initial, what its initial, um, how can I put this? When it establishes a certain proposition, so for How I Met Your Mother, How I Met Your Mother, like the mother itself, uh, that is something that is fundamentally part of the show, which is why in turn the fact that the finale ended up killing the mother and then leading him back to Robin, it was very odd and you feel like you just wasted a lot of times, or a lot of time on it. Which then goes back to my very first point that does it ruin the whole show in a little bit? Yeah, because the whole premise is where's the mother? At what point do they find each other? At what point do they crisscross? All of that stuff. And how important she is to who Ted had to become, as you mentioned in the, uh, I believe it was the uh, St. Patrick's Day episode where he got beat up for pretending he was a guy named Garrido and like having this guy pay for his drinks and stuff. All of those moments that led Ted to be a person that would be able to be with someone like Tracy, those are important character moments. But when you go back and watch the show, you're not really, it's no longer How I Met Your Mother. It's just let's watch these five friends go on their little journeys because ultimately at the end, it's all going out the window anyways. And for some reason, everyone's okay with the fact that Barney and Robin got together. I mean, not everybody. And by everybody, I mean the people in the show, the characters in the show. They got together in the first episode of season five, which is where I was going at that point, with that point, and it just became really, really weird, especially for how important Robin meant to Ted and how he established that for to Barney. And yeah, they had one episode or maybe two episodes where they weren't friends, but that got cleared up quickly. And then season five comes along and they're together, and then that goes down the tubes. And then they spend the entire last season on this wedding only to completely wipe the slate of it in like the first 30 minutes of their two part finale special. Like what the hell, which the shitty thing is, is that that two parter was actually really nice. That episode, it's our two part episode and the Gary Blauman episode in season nine were really great. Classic. How I met your mother episodes. In fact, you can tell they shot them separately because, uh, the guy that plays Marshall Erickson was a lot skinnier in the opening of season eight and nine or whatever it was than he was in those last three episodes. He had changed quite a bit. And it was also the setting was different and everything like that. Like it just seemed very lazy and very thrown together and they didn't know what to do. And they thought, oh, this is a great idea. Let's make an entire episode within two, three days of this wedding that we're just going to throw away in the first 20 minutes. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, Arturo says, Avatar The Last Airbender was one I loved. The se- That 70s show was, was all right, and The Office was one I was a bit disappointed in. And so, yeah, I was talking about The Office. So The Office ultimately has uh, two finales in a way. I would have been fine if they finished The Office with Goodbye, Michael, because that was a great episode, because it was already losing some steam up until that point, at least for me, and they ended up really doing a great job with Goodbye Michael. Then the last couple seasons came, they had the Robert California seasons which had some bright spots, but it was really just just a weird season. And then the finale or the final season showed up and then they tried to do that spin-off with the Shrewd family, and I believe it was supposed to be called Shrewd Farms, so that was that like second last episode was where like his family shows up and his aunt dies and everything like that. So all that happens and the spin-off Obviously wasn't received very well, but then they brought it in or they they really did a, a pretty good job, in my opinion, with the final finale. I mean, they brought in Michael Scott, which was really nice. 
He didn't take away from that finale. It was good to see him again because he's always in the back of our minds. And it helped kind of bring closure to some of these characters for the two seasons that were there. Did we need it? Not really. And the reason we didn't need it is because it did a lot of really weird things with a lot of the characters in there. First of all, Nelly was unnecessary. The, the whole Nelly thing was unnecessary. I didn't care for her. Um, and the Andy, Andy himself just became really bad. Like to the point where he was just a bad person. Like that episode he came back from his, his cruise ship or whatever, hated it. Terrible. Like you, you took him from somebody that he wasn't beloved, but he was just quirky and kind of just the way that he was. And you kind of turned him into the bad guy and he was a real dick. And not only that is that you, then you had to feel sorry for Nelly because he was a dick to Nelly, even though she was the one that kind of emasculated him, demasculated, emasculated, emasculated. That's the one. So they were doing some things where they were forcing us to like certain characters that we weren't really wanting to like. And having us really dislike characters that we were in for. And I know that he had to shoot Hangover 3, and that's why they shot that episode, but still, you're the ones that are controlling these characters' fates. You can change the way that they operate. You can you can have him bring come back to do something else. I don't know. So it, The Office is an interesting one because it has kind of two seasons. But again, they could have just ended it with Goodbye Michael, and it that episode alone makes up for some of the slower, not as great episodes before. Um, so that's one example. But it doesn't actually ruin the entire viewing experience for me because it was just called The Office and it was about these characters in The Office. So you can still go back and watch this stuff happen, but unlike a Game of Thrones which ended up making John being Aegon Targaryen mean absolutely nothing. And Aya being Arya, sorry, being the, um, the, uh, faceless woman, faceless girl also kind of mean nothing except for the fact that it was an excuse that she could ghost from here to there and just show up wherever she needed to. Um, just all of these things that they incorporated, ultimately didn't mean much. And these are the things that we were speculating as fans, and I've said this before. The show invites us to talk about their show. The show invites us to come up with the theories. The show invites the book readers to um, piece together what they already know of certain events, but how they get to them is also just as important. And so when you're inviting the audience to get in on that conversation, and then you completely go, sideways and make them mean me they make them be meaningless well i know i'm never going to watch game of thrones again and i don't need to because i know that there's no importance to them you may feel differently and that is 100 percent totally okay because you're just going to enjoy those little pockets of conversations that were happening and things that were happening with certain characters but for me as a viewer i want there to be an importance to the things that i'm watching I'm wanting there to be importance to the conversations that I'm happening. If I have a theory and I like don't just subvert my expectations for the sake of subverting my expectations. They're creators. I am not a creative person. I don't know how to rewrite some of these episodes. I could rewrite the finale just based on what they have there. And I like I don't know if it'd be that great, but at least there'd be some things that visually would be cool to see. For instance, Drogon not burning down the throne. Because I never knew that he knew that the throne was important at all. So there was no point for him to do that. Um, and him trying to burn John and John not getting burnt, just like Daenerys, because his Targaryen side stops him from doing that. Like, that is just one moment that could have changed the entire finale, at least for me, but something that I thought would be cool because then it puts in a lot of weight to the fact that he is Aegon Targaryen. The fact that Ned Stark pretty much made his name, like sullied his own name to protect his sister and to protect Jon. Like, that is something that nobody would ever do. And I don't want to say he died in vain, but he died with that secret that ultimately meant nothing, which is a huge betrayal to him because for some reason, at least for me, Ned Stark was present throughout the entire show. There's always that part of it that meant something, to me, at least, as a viewer. 
What else do I got? Okay, we talked about The Sopranos. Oh, The Sopranos, The Blackout, for instance, does not ruin the entire show for me. It doesn't, because it is one of those ambiguous endings that doesn't betray what has already been established. Game of Thrones betrays a lot of stuff that is it established. How I Met Your Mother betrays a lot of what it has established. And those are the kind of things that don't make a finale or don't make a show worth revisiting or you don't revisit them with the same energy and the same excitement to to figure out, hey, what did I miss? What what little hints did I drop? Um, I remember I mentioned a couple times, I the first time I watched Fight Club, had no idea what the hell was going on. And I had my huge holy shit moment. And then every single time I rewatch it, I pick up things. And it makes it that much better because they all that stuff meant something to the final product. Again, Breaking Bad, all those moments meant something. And those char- those moments of character development between Walt overlapping with Jesse, those mean something at the very end of the show. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... I got another one. What else do I have? What else do I have? Um, the slow moving car crash. Oh, some other points is when, yeah, when it seems like they're stretching out certain points and they're going back and forth with characters. For instance, if you look at Friends, you can tell they had no idea what they were doing towards the end because the whole Rachel and Joey relationship was weird and it didn't need to happen at all. Really weird. Um, what else was there? Dexter. Dexter is another show that I really liked and I'm sure a lot of people liked and it was a top tier show. The whole. Fake your death in the storm ex machina lumberjack finale was real dumb. But you can tell it was going down the rails when his sister, I mean, not his real sister, but still, the character who was, they were always calling each other brother and sister, that got really, really uncomfortably weird towards the end. Like, they didn't need to make her character that manic over him. That's something that they could have just, you know, tabled on the side and not had that happen. Because once that happened... Essentially, after the Trinity Killer was killed, that's when the whole show started to just kind of ramp down in a really weird way where they were throwing in things just for either shock, for awe, for just begging us to hang on, to keep watching. Uh, House of Cards. So aside from the fact that Kevin Spacey left the show and uh, it was up to, um, oh shit, I'm blanking on her name. Damn it. No, I lost it. Uh, Claire Underwood was taking over. That part didn't bother me because the show for me had, was kind of going downhill in season three, to be honest. Because especially once he became president, it just became a really silly show that didn't didn't have the magic that that first season had. Because that first season, I've rewatched a couple times, and it is really good. The second season, it's... It's not nearly as good, but it is definitely better. So it started off amazing, and then the second season started off okay, and then it just kind of went just real dumb towards the end of it. And in that case, I don't know if anything got betrayed or if they just couldn't come up with clever things to put in there. Um, It, it kind of had that Suits situation where they keep coming up with a monologue and in that monologue, they're talking about how they're going to go kick ass. And then the the music, like there's a musical sting or not really a sting, but just a, a musical number that happens that ramps you up. And you're like, great, next scene, they're going to do something. And then all of a sudden, nothing happens. And they do that four or five times in an episode, which made a lot of Frank's um, monologues, like fourth wall breaking monologues, pointless because he just started to become a, a stupid character that didn't like they tried to make the fact that he was president not as easy as he thought, which I got. At least that's what I think they were trying to do. But none of his intelligence of him being whip did anything or even VP or any like none of that stuff seemed to matter. And then they have Claire at the end of it, which it wasn't that it was bad. It was just sluggish and super boring, which I think they could have done a lot better. Uh, and then ultimately Claire killing Doug, Doug by a stabbing in the Oval Office, like that's how you're going to end it. I mean, I guess they were, I guess you can say that since the whole Kevin Spacey scandal was breaking out and they got rid of him and they had to rewrite a bunch of stuff. I mean, it's great for them that they were able to rally and go forward from there. But I don't know, it it, it fell off hard for me about the second season 
midway or towards the end of the second season for sure with a couple of bright spots towards the end there. But then the third season was just, you know, really, really weird. Uh, and by weird, I mean just really boring and it wasn't as impactful as th- how great, how wonderfully written that first season was. Um, What else? Oh, is it better to be ambiguous or obvious? So this is another note I took. So obvious is, I guess, Game of Thrones. Like just whatever happened, happened. And whether we like it or not, it just happened. It's it's pretty clear. Uh, whereas Lost, which I haven't come back to yet, Lost has the ambiguous finale in a way. And even more so The Sopranos does with it being a full blackout. OK, but you can kind of piece together what's going to happen. So. I'm going to say that I would prefer an ambiguous episode, obviously one that's done well, that garners or that warrants an ambiguous episode fina- finale or uh, yeah, sorry, finale that I can ponder on and think about and come up with ideas for and talk to my friends about and the, the rest of the guys here. Those I prefer over a poorly written, obvious episode. Breaking Bad is a wonderfully written, amazing episode, in my opinion. And it's obvious, and it's great. I know that the the only ambiguity there is that Jesse uh, got away, but they're doing a movie on Netflix, so, I mean, that's going to go out the window, too. Lost has the ambiguous episode where, where they actually in purgatory, even though the creators are saying they're not. Um... I don't care for that episode as much or that way of doing things. And mostly because um, we all know that they were pretty much purgatory. That's what the show was setting up. But the creators kept saying, no, they're not. No, they're not. Now, if you remember when Juliet had died, she looked to Sawyer and she said, it worked. We did it. And when I think back on that, especially after watching Endgame, the sideways reality that they were living in, like I was thinking, this is it. Like th- this is what has happened. You've you've saved whatever you've saved in this timeline, and you were able to create a better timeline for these people, not to lead them to a purgatory and then for that whenever they're all ready, they can go up and stuff. It's they bettered their lives, and and Juliet was able to better their lives. Someone who is a doctor. Uh, and and with this whole time travel thing that they established for that sideways reality where things were were good, if I remember. It's been a long time since I watched it, but I remember little points. And that, much like Bran in Game of Thrones, Desmond, who is one of my personal favorites in the show, Desmond was the memory of both those lives. And he was a part of both of them. And even though they don't remember it, he does. And he's able to thread the needle so to speak and the island was this kind of uh if you've played god of war and i don't know if this is a good analogy if you played the recent god of war which if you haven't please 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 do it it's so good the world tree you can travel and like you can flip it over and like go to different areas in there so it, it kind of the, the island kind of acted as this um middle point for this time traveling thing that they established and so at the end of it it wasn't really ambiguous but it kind of was in a sense because the creators kept telling us that it wasn't a purgatory even though essentially they were all just waiting there because essentially his dad says hey i'm waiting for you like we've been waiting for you and join us and everything like that and eyes close and then he ends up being on the island with the dog and, and it ends the exact same way it started off with right like there were some really good parts in that but that was an ambiguous episode that kind of didn't answer anything. And I think when, we, when we're when we looking at our shows, we do want answers to some things, but ultimately we don't know what we want. And we're watching these shows coming up with these ideas, and we don't know really what we want until we get it, and we're either on board or we're not. But if you're establishing certain things... Those are those are things that you're putting out there that are supposed to be answered, that are supposed to be part of the conversation, that are supposed to be part of your finale. All, like, don't introduce something that is seemingly important 
and then just ultimately make it unimportant in one episode. Going back to Game of Thrones again, The Night King, which from what I understand, and I mentioned on the show before from people that have read the books, he's not that big into it. And I believe it's a, uh, it is an allegory for the mystical that a lot of people believe that they think is important, but there's a real thing going on, which is the Game of Thrones. But the show decided to make it extremely important to Jon's character and the North in general, but specifically to Jon's character. And Jon's character also had the fact that he was Aegon Targaryen, extremely important. And none of those did we get answers for. The spirals didn't make sense. I, I mean, unless you just subscribe to the fact that it's just a mark that's been like, like Brooks was here. That's that's their idea of a Brooks was here. And, but they established these questions early on. They made these giant reveals. They made it important. And so that's where, for me, it is kind of a betrayal of what the fuck we were watching the show for. Like, and that's why Game of Thrones is one of those shows that I don't need to watch again. And even Lost, to an extent, is another show that I don't need to watch again because, well, it ends in this kind of purgatorial way of ending it, which they didn't have to do it that way. <coughs> and I'm not a very insightful person. Like, I, I don't pick up on a lot of the nuances that a lot of people do. So there's probably someone listening right now that's telling me, like, no, like, it's something completely different. It's, um... Uh, how can I put this? It's closing out the original uh, story or it's closing out both the sideways and the the other one, the real timeline and all of that stuff. And the Dharma Initiative part was just there as to add mystery to it. And uh, they're just this crew that was there trying to figure out time travel, essentially, which is what they ended up doing to begin with. Like, th there's probably somebody yelling at me right now, which I totally understand and I apologize for. Um, what else do I have here? Here's another one, um, Roseanne, which is a show that I, I didn't watch hardcore, but I remember watching and I remember really hating a lot of things that they did. And, and that finale ended up being, you know, a pretty shitty finale where she's just writing an autobiography pretending that they won the lottery, mostly because the show went downhill when they decided to win the lottery. And the reason the show went downhill, at least for me, is that it went against the all-American family that they were establishing, this family that through thick and thin, still gets through the shit that's happening. Um, it's it's one of the it's an important and integral, fundamental foundation to what the show is about. And having her do an autobiography and that Dan died and that they didn't actually win the lottery, it's all in her head, all of that stuff. That's kind of just to clean that part up. Killing Dan was a weird thing. If I remember, again, this has been years and years and years, so what I specifically remember that he died in that. And it was all this stuff that she was coming up in her mind in a monologue. Like, that's that's a retcon that doesn't really work, at least for me. Uh, Arturo, it's like Anthony said last week, with an ending you want them to finish stories, not add possibilities, open for more questions. And so, yes and no to that. So if you know that they're doing, let's say, another spinoff show, then possibilities and maybe more questions is fine. If the questions are, for instance, John had a smile on his face and then there was like grass that was coming up from like beyond the wall, beyond the wall or something like that, if I remember correctly. And John had a bit of a smile on his face, which was kind of him being where he wanted to be. That's what I took. But if there was more of a, like Bran had this evil look on his face and a smile, then that's kind of a possibility or question to be like, oh, yo, he is the bad guy. And they all screwed up and, and they all messed up and there's no rightful person to do it or whatever it is, right? But he, he Anthony made a really good point, though, because it is. Yeah, if you add more questions that late into the game then and you haven't even answered a lot of the questions that you've established, then that's just silly. That's just dumb. Like, what's the point? You're not even going to answer them. I mean, they might answer them in the books if people are going to go back and read the books. And a part of me really wants to, and I, I might even do it um, if it's true that the books are coming out like within a year or something like that. But who knows? Uh, but if they if they ask, sorry, uh, if you finish the stories, yeah. If they don't finish the stories and they keep adding on more questions that are extra on top of the questions we already have, then it's like, well, what was the point? There's a lot of weird stuff like that. Um, 
I had a question. Uh, what is it? Ruins the experience, reputation. Does it tarnish the whole? Or leave it with an asterisk. Yeah, I put asterisk part, which I've kind of it's kind of been the crux of this whole this whole uh, episode so far is is asterisk on um, on these shows that are beloved. And there's there's a lot that I missed here. From what I understand, Gilmore Girls didn't have one. I didn't watch it. Two and a Half Men. I didn't watch. The people didn't like that finale. I um, think Gossip Girl was another one. I don't remember. Again, not a show that I watched. Uh, True Blood was another one. I went through probably 12 different lists, and these are like some of the big ones. Um, another one I wanted, to, another two that I haven't mentioned so far, uh, as, aside from their name, is House and Seinfeld. So Seinfeld kind of did that thing that a lot of shows do halfway through their seasons or halfway or a little bit three quarters towards the end of their season, where they kind of go back and they relive a lot of the moments to be like, hey, remember how great this was? And let's like poke you with a little bit of a nostalgia prod. Uh, and that's kind of what their whole finale was, was a rehash of all the stuff that they did, which because they masked it behind a good Samaritan law that they brought up, it kind of made them villains, but they just, they weren't great people, but they weren't any worse than any other people. And so to give them like a good Samaritan law type of, deal that they can just imprison them behind because apparently these were the worst of the worst based on the the parade of characters that they brought in for nostalgic purposes for the show it was kind of like i don't know i've seen worse people like a lot worse people in that show and these guys didn't deserve to go to prison and it was kind of it was still funny how they finished it with the exact same button joke that they opened up the show with in the pilot but again, that was one of those seasons, like, I adore Seinfeld. Uh, like, it's my favorite sitcom of all time. And right now, Bra- Brooklyn, blah, sorry, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is, pro- is creeping up there yeah, as a second. But they did what they did with Seinfeld, rehashed all the characters in, like, two episodes or whatever, and then threw them in jail, and that was it. And it was kind of like, eh, like, they, they weren't as bad as you think they were at least for that type of finale. Like, they deserved a better finale. Uh, Real Locker Room Talk. Uh, Real Locker Room Talk is a podcast that is out of Calgary, Alberta, and they're a sports podcast, and they are good friends of mine, and I like them, and they're awesome, and they are hilarious. They're funnier than I am. So thanks for joining in on the live, boys. I'm kind of by myself, and I'm rambling, so um, that's just the way that it's going this episode. Um, another show, oh, let me know what shows uh, you like the finale for, you hated the finale for, um, if you want, in the chat. House is another one, which should have ended in, I believe it was the eighth season, seven or eighth season, because that last season when he was in prison and then comes out of it, and then he has his kind of faked Sherlock Holmes death while he's going through these moments of clarity where he's reliving or seeing other people that were part of his crew, like 13 and Kuttner and um, I believe Wilson's, yeah, Wilson's uh, girlfriend or wife that died and stuff like that. It was really weird. And the fact that they didn't have the main character who was the head of the hospital in that kind of shows you that like, you know, a lot of people knew that it was done and over with. Um, But that was another one where it kind of, him riding off in the sunset with Wilson was kind of sweet, but he was a worse person, even though he saved a bunch of lives. He was a pretty shitty person in comparison to, let's say, the Seinfeld characters that went to jail for their whole Good Samaritan Law thing. Um, and that whole, again, that whole season, it introduced some interesting characters in it, and they had some decent plot points, but for the most part, it was just that whole season, much like How I Met Your Mother, was just this slow kind of car crash that crescendoed and then all of a sudden ended up leaving itself in pieces by the end of the season um even though house is again a really good show but again, but one of, in those situations house you can still kind of go back and watch it because he ultimately just rode off into the sunset it was unfulfilling but it doesn't change anything about how house was um aside from the fact that you found out that he really cared for his friend that was pretty much it so you know that's kind of one of those things and again seinfeld Different type of show than uh, Dexter or Game of Thrones or Lost or The Sopranos or even Mad Men where you have to get invested in everything that's going on and there's pieces that are happening. The Mad Men episode or the finale, uh, which I didn't mention, was that there's a lot of stuff that they introduce about Don Draper's character that 
in that case, I wanted more out of than what the show was wanting to give me. And I'm a little bit okay with it. I just didn't really care for that last 10 minutes of the finale. It just, the way that it ended was really just interesting. Um, Sopranos final years later makes more sense or finale years later makes more sense. This is from the real locker room talk. TNG squad, TNG mob squad, actually, uh, at the, at the time, very frustrating, but now makes sense. Life goes on. Yep. That's a good point. And it kind of goes back to that same thing of what do we expect from our shows? And it's another point that I made of, we do get invested too much sometimes. Um, like anything else now that the, the, for the guys at real locker room talk, you guys get invested in sports big time. I get invested in movies a lot. They are escape. They let us forget about a lot of things and focus on something else. And we do tend to get too invested. And with that, with millions of people getting invested in one thing, you're never, ever going to please every single person. So with something like a game of Thrones, you can use that as an excuse I wouldn't because they were there there was some clear stuff they were looking at doing but for something like Lost for something like Sopranos like they mentioned there are or even Mad Men for instance there's so many people that were watching it that were looking to get something out of it there's some people that are satisfied with these finales um then there's others that aren't um I think Anthony loved in the office the um the Robert California stuff and you know I didn't care for it um, but he loved it and that's great for him. And, but he didn't get as invested and he also didn't get as invested in game of Thrones that whatever happened would affect him. It affected, let's say me more than it did him. And it affected Vass more than it affected uh, anybody else. But Vass is more lenient with this stuff. Bless his heart because it allows him to just enjoy the things for as they are, where I'm kind of poking and prodding and I want to see what I'm going to get out of it and what they're able to tie together. What else do I got here? What else do I got? Oh, and so being invested in it, we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot or paint ourselves in a corner or any type of thing like that where we're kind of just going to be left unsatisfied. And it's kind of like that. Oh, the journey versus the destination. It's like, that's great. But the destination still has to make sense. And uh, because I'm I'm invested in this this journey and yeah, like I've been too invested in things before and to the point where like it enrages me for things. Um, you've probably heard it on the show a bunch of times. And so I've shot myself in the foot being like, what were my expectations for something? Um, I remember at the time when I first watched the Seinfeld finale, it didn't bother me nearly as much as other people. Later on in life, it kind of bothered me a bit more. But I love that show for the individual episodes not for a general overarching story of just these characters. Like I loved living with these characters in any situation they were in. So it was a bit different Uh, for how I met your mother though. You're invested in the tale of the mother, how they meet. What are the things that end up, you know, conspiring to get him uh, away from her or whether he did it himself or it was caused by other people, whether it was Barney getting his way or his love for Robin or any, any number of things that they did. It was the fact that um, all those moments tie into an overarching thing that ends up being the mother, right? Which the secondary finale that they had where he literally just goes up to her, says hi, and then he says, and kids, that's how I met your mother. That is a nice, sweet finale. And guess what? He met the mother. What's the show about? How I Met Your Mother. That's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, what makes a show beloved is kind of probably my final point. What am I at? 53 minutes on my own. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, what makes a show beloved? Aside from the fact that you can enjoy a show by yourself and love certain aspects of the show by yourself. In my opinion, a show increases its level when you realize that there are more of you out there. Um, I can, I can hearken back to uh, MCU, even Game of Thrones, even Lost. Lost elevated the TV game for me personally because we were all talking about it. And at the time, I remember binging up to season five and then watching the final couple seasons or whatever it was, uh, watching it week by week. And in those weeks, that's where the magic is. That's where you start loving these shows because it is part of your world. 
just like any sports team where you're talking about how they're going to do next year, what trades they're going to do, what is the coach doing, how are, his, how are their stats looking compared to somebody else, how do you square them up against these guys on that side. You get invested in all of this stuff because you're sharing it with other people. And as cheesy as this sounds, it's in that sh- is in that act of sharing it with other people and experiencing it, experiencing it with other people, sorry, that makes it so beloved. That's why Game of Thrones was one of the biggest I would say it's the biggest show that has ever come out and for all we know will be for the next 10 years or something unless something else big 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 like that comes in and the reason is is because you all it's also adapted from these books that people loved the reason why Lord of the Rings was so big is because these books that people loved that came out years ago and now they're adapting them on they, they adapted them on screen and people were able to, they have read them. Harry Potter was another one. Harry Potter is massive for that. And for the reason that people are excited just to see that and get involved in it. And whereas Harry Potter was less of a mystery, at least for me, because I read up to four, but you kind of knew how things were going to go and you knew how the movies were going to go. It still inspired a conversation and it still inspired a love and cosplay and and, and birthday parties. Like uh, I know my buddy, Ethan and Ashley, who... Like, for his birthday, they dressed up as Harry Potter and Hermione. Like, it was awesome. It was really cool. And, you know, that they both love those characters. And when you love the characters that are involved in it, that's what makes a show beloved. And, unfortunately, double-edged sword, it is why we get to invest it in these things. Because we feel that we're a part of it. We feel that we're that we're in with them. Because we have been on that journey with them in a way. And we've got a million of our friends that are with us joining in. Um, there's been people's careers that have been started on YouTube and other outlets based on that. And it's really cool to watch. And it's really awesome to watch people get involved in it. And just like the MCU, this huge cultural phenomenon that people have been following. And yes, it had its questions. But we were also just along for the ride, and everyone was wondering how it's going to end, what's going to happen, who's going to die, who isn't going to die, who's going to get what, and and who's going to get the best outcome, and who's going to get what they deserve versus other people that aren't going to get what they deserve. It's moments like that that make the the media itself, or the sorry, not the media, the TV shows, the movies, uh, and and other things that you and your friends can get involved in that much more special because it is. It does super or it does transcend the genre. That's kind of the best way to put it. It transcends the genre in a way that it is that moment of, you know, picturing the entire globe holding hands just for let's say a Game of Thrones or an MCU or something like that. Because we care about it. Because we love it. Because we're invested. Because we've been like talking the shit out of all this stuff for the longest time and it's fucking awesome. And the more people discover it, the more uh the more exciting it gets and you can be like, Oh yeah, what about this? What about that? Um, a friend of mine, uh, when he started Game of Thrones, it was a little bit earlier or sorry, not earlier later. And when he started it, he started calling me more often. And it's not like we weren't talking before. We were probably on a, you know, we were talking once a month. He lives, you know, he lives in another, uh, another city. And then all of a sudden we started talking like once a week about it and more. And, and a lot of it was so he can remember all the names in Game of Thrones and what's going on and who's connected to who because it's a lot of information. And then even in this last season, every single week we would talk and break down what happened in the episode before, regardless of if we hated it or if we loved it. And it was this weird thing because, yeah, at the end of it, because you beloved it so much, you ultimately feel betrayed when it doesn't end up the way you want it to be. And I think that's where... It's that double-edged sword where we feel betrayed at the end of the day. And it's interesting because it's like, do we des- like do we deserve to get the ending that we want? Or are we should we feel that way? Are we allowed to feel that way? And, you know, to um to Weiss and Benioff who uh, were who responded to the position petition or sorry, they're like, why don't you guys write your own season you ungrateful shits and I know a lot of a lot of pundits on the one side on Twitter I was watching they're like oh good for you guys you know standing up to them and everything like that but for you to say something like that I get it you're you're putting it all out but we don't know how much you're invested in it if you remember Star Wars 
George Lucas wasn't really invested in the acting part of it, and you can tell, especially in the prequels, where there's behind-the-scenes shots of him literally reading in the newspaper, and the actors had to just do whatever they did. Um, sorry, I'm just going to cut myself off really quick. There's 17 seconds left on the live show. Uh, thank you so much for those of you who joined in on the live show uh, right now. Uh, it's the first one doing it on my own. Sorry. It won't be uh, happening often. Unfortunately, again, we lost our other account. But anyways, I'll catch you guys later. Bye. Uh, anyways, everybody else... Um Sorry, I'm just sharing it. See what happens. Uh, for those of you who are still with me, thank you so much for bearing with me for about an hour now. I'm going to wrap it up pretty quick. Um, but when you look at the Star Wars, like I mentioned, you had a creator there that didn't really care about the acting part of it, and you can see that where the priorities lied. And there are talks of Weiss and Benioff that are like, oh, they are focused on they themselves, Star Wars. And so that's why the last season suffered. And, you know, in one of the behind the scenes stuff, you have that one guy who was a writer and he was like, he cried like he was tearing up talking about how he loves the character so much. And fuck, give the show to him. Let him finish it because he clearly cares about it a little bit more than you guys are putting across. Um, I know that in one of the behind the scenes one as well, they mentioned like we knew the episode was going to be 73 minutes. No, you did not. No, you fucking didn't. They said that we knew Arya for three years was going to be the one to kill the Night King. That's a stretch. Like, I, I don't think so. And just because they said it doesn't make it true. So, I mean, I guess what I'm ultimately saying is that finales are a finicky thing, and it's really hard to decide whether it does ruin the entire experience for you and whether you do get a satisfying conclusion or at least a conclusion that you're okay with. Uh, much like the gentleman at Royal Locker Room Talk, Mitch and Dimitri was saying, like, as I got older, that finale sat wet better with me. And even when I rethink Lost, which has been coming up lately, which is really weird, like it's online a lot as a as like a new topic. I also kind of rethink about that. And I'm like, okay, it's not as bad as I thought. How I Met Your Mother has got fucking worse. Um, Friends had a wonderful finale. That doesn't count. Mad Men, again, still a wonderful show. The finale was just kind of meh. Uh, House, again, meh. Seinfeld, meh. House of Cards dropped off after season two for me. Dexter, kind of dumb. Again, Game of Thrones, can't go back and watch it. The Office, I still watch it. I still put it in the back. Like, there's there's very few shows out there that, because the finale was terrible or not, just not great and kind of betrayed the essence of the show, there's very few of them that I won't go back and, and kind of take a look at or rethink. And the conversations come up because a lot of times... Fuck, we don't have much to talk about on the show. We run out of things to talk about. Um, but I'm going to leave it at that. I really, really, really appreciate anybody that has is still listening to this point. Thank you for cutting me some slack on this kind of, uh, it is a filler episode, but I wanted to put something out. Um, and, you know, I try to do as much research as I can, but even in my research, I, I just I just tend to ramble because I go on on my own, uh, my own tangents. Um, it is confirmed that unfortunately our main account entertain facts has been deleted due to copyright stuff, um, which is kind of shitty. He didn't get any warning or anything like that. So if you were listening in on the live show, we're going to just keep pumping it out through our, uh, F word podcast or the F word. Um, yeah, sorry. The F word podcast, um, Instagram account. And there is a new development coming up for those of you who live in Saskatchewan, uh, or just anywhere. For all the Saskatchewan-based people that are listening, there is something in the works. I can't say too much what it is, but it's going to be really good for other podcasts in Saskatchewan. Um, so you can take that as you want. Uh, you can speculate all you want uh, if you so want to. But there's a lot of really good content happening in all the provinces. I mean, all over the place. The, there's really good content happening. And it looks like what this might be is kind of uh, co combining all the resources together. Not into one show, of course, but to kind of one HQ for a lot of Saskatchewan-based podcasts. So um, when I, the more I get, the more details I get, the more I can let you all know. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, these are much harder to do on your own, especially when you're not as well. Um, you don't, you don't articulate as well as some other people. That's uh, kind of been my, my issue. So that's why I like having other people on there that I can bounce ideas off of. So if, uh, from wherever you're listening to, thank you so much. Um, and for those of you, if this is your first episode catching us, thank you again. Uh, you'll know, you'll realize a couple of things. One, my intros are terrible because I can never find the right footing and two are 
endings, much like some of the shows that I mentioned, tend to kind of trip up a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's a constant work in progress. You can always find our episode on Anchor, Stitcher Radio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Podbean, Radio Public, and we have our YouTube channel, which is now at about 915 or so subscribers. Um, and uh, yeah, make sure you're following the F Word Podcast on Instagram and you know wherever you're listening to, if you can drop a like or even a comment on there, let us know. Good or bad, doesn't matter. If you don't have the time or you don't want to, that's cool too. But if you do want to send any suggestions for the show, you can always email us at the F Word Podcast at gmail.com. Calm. That'll be it for me. Again, I can't thank you enough for whoever's still here at this time, at the hour and six minute mark or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm G, and I am out. <laughs>